this is Craig Brown and welcome to Passages. Passages is a space to explore Bible passages used for preaching, reflection, and prayer. My hope is that Passages will shine a unique light on text used for preaching at the First Free Methodist Church of Seattle or for anyone looking to dive deeper into the Bible. Today's passage is from the book of Micah, chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. It's the basis for the sermon at First Free Methodist Church on October 8, 2023. It's part of our series called Vitality, Rest, Renew, Reset, as we live into a life of renewal with God. Let's hear first this text from Micah, chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. And it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and the people will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob so that he may teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth law and from the word of the Lord and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty distant nations. They will beat their swords into plowshares. They will beat their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and neither, never again will they train for war. Instead, each of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree with no one to make them afraid because the mouth of the Lord of the armies has spoken. Though all the peoples walk, each in the name of his God, as for us, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. This is a beautiful text in Micah chapter 4, and one verse in particular uh, is quite well known, verse 3, about swords being uh, beaten into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. But we want to give this text just a little bit more context in verses 1 through 5. As this text opens in verse 1, we read of a safe and a saved future. Micah was a prophet during the closing days of Israel and the transitioning days of Judah. Now, just as a reminder, at this point in Israel's history, they've really divided now into two nations— out of the 12 tribes of Israel, the 10 northern tribes are a nation called Israel, and the two southern tribes are a nation called Jerusalem. And at this time, both of these nations are in existence, although the northern kingdom of Israel is facing its final days. Micah was a prophet during these closing days of Israel and the transitioning days of Judah. And so for Judah, the kings that were reigning over uh, that nation during the time of the prophet Micah were Jotham, Ahaz, and then Hezekiah, uh, Hezekiah being probably the most well-known out of those three. And then in Israel, in the northern kingdom, uh, it was a divided kingdom with uh, different kings vying for the throne. And ultimately, that northern kingdom was defeated by the Assyrian Empire, who had been fighting a war uh, against the Phoenicians and then the Philist against Philistia or the Philistines. And in the process of their withdrawal, uh, they ended up capturing the entire northern nation of Israel. And they, they did that over a slow period of time. It wasn't one giant invasion. It, it kind of came as a trickle through different Assyrian kings and leaders, uh, Tiglath-Pileser III, Shalmaneser V, Sargon II, and then ultimately, Sennacherib is the one uh, that finally uh, conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. It wasn't so much that the Assyrians lacked the capacity to uh, defeat Israel quickly. It's that it simply wasn't a priority for them to do so. So Micah follows in a pattern of prophets in this pivotal time when Israel is defeated in less than 25 years and Judah shrinks to become not so much a nation anymore as it becomes simply a city-state around the city of Jerusalem. And so all this is to say that both of these nations, both Israel and Judah, are now in their closing years of existence before Israel is conquered by Sennacherib and then the Jews 
uh, not many years later, uh, less than 100 years later, are conquered by the Neo-Babylonian Empire. There's a rhythm to this book. When you pick up the book of Micah, there's these uh, uh, alternating oracles. There's one oracle that's on judgment against Israel and Judah, and then there's an oracle of promise for Israel and Judah, and then an oracle against and an oracle for, and it kind of switches back and forth throughout all seven chapters of Micah. So Micah opens in verse 1 with these words that the mountain of the Lord is lifted up. Well, um, depending on who you are, that could be a bunch of different mountains uh, because part of the issue between Israel and Judah is that they were still in some fierce religious competition with each other. If you're Israel, the northern kingdom, your mountain is Bethel or even Shiloh. If you're Judah, the mountain is Jerusalem. But as we continue to read verse 1, Micah begins to make it clear the mountain he's talking about is Jerusalem and Mount Zion. And it talks about it being raised up. Now, being raised up doesn't literally mean that the mountain itself was made taller, but it's really more figurative. It's a place of primacy, of being more important. And the, the words here in verse 1 are the people streaming to it. They're coming to it. It's the same Hebrew word used here for river. And so it's an inversion, if you will. Rivers typically lead away from mountains. This river is a river of people going up a mountain. So this is clearly an act of God's doing as uh, people come to the mountain of the Lord. It says that the people will stream to it upstream. That's a key passageway for us. Even in the most desperate times, our hope remains in God. You see, God is working and moving in this well-known text from Micah. And uh, part of this text in Micah is also, uh, also appears in the book of Isaiah. Uh, Israel has been in turmoil and ultimately defeat, and Judah is being hemmed in all around. Yet hope remains for God's people. So we must never forget God's presence with us and the world around us. We live in similar times, very much like this text in Micah chapter 4. We have to remember in these challenging days after pandemic, political polarity, tensions are high, controversies seem to rage, that in the midst of all that, our hope has to remain in God alone. We then turn to verses 2. Two in the beginning of verse 3. So how is it exactly that these rivers of people flow up to Jerusalem? And so uh, using a form of uh, parallelism, which is a common tool in Hebrew poetry, the prophet cites the inner reflection of the people. So it's in other words, in verse 2, it's uh, describing the inner deliberations of people. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. This kind of inner uh, reflection that's going on uh, is up to this mountain of the house of Jacob. Remember, Jacob is the same uh, person who was renamed Israel. And so they're to come up to this mountain where uh, God is teaching and moving so that God will teach us about his ways. Now, notice it doesn't say laws. It says ways in verse 2, so that we may teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. It's nuanced language here. It's not about the law and being obedient to it. It has a different tone to it. It's almost like um, being tutored or being helped along the way, uh, being mentored in some ways, what this language is kind of alluding to. And this is where the word, ultimately, of God and the law, yes, come from, Jerusalem. There's something primary about this place. And from this thread and tradition of life, the instruction that God needs to give will come. Now, notice the scope of this, how all this will come together. It says uh, at the end of verse 2, from, from Zion will go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty distant nations. Probably obvious about wh wh who Micah is talking about here. This is probably the Assyrians in some way. This is a global response that Micah is envisioning. 
Uh, it's not just a national one. It's not just about uh, Israelites and Jews returning home. This is before the exile. Uh, this is a, a, a global response. And God is judge in this picture is important. The land is being emptied and hemmed in by the Assyrians. So there's this is kind of a future act of judgment on God's part. So in other words, God is saying that, that God is going to gather all these people together, but at the same time, people are leaving. They're being kicked out of their own land. So there's an inversion of what's going on here. And so this is a backhanded way of telling Judah and Israel that this judgment that God is going to bring is going to come in the future. And there's going to be a way that God gathers all people together once again. This is another key passageway for us. For here we can see that God is drawing people to himself. And that's God's work to do. We don't. This is tremendously hard for Christians to understand. We go about the work of evangelism and mission and service many times as if God needs it. Far from it. God is at work in ways we can never comprehend. It is one thing to work for it. It's quite another thing to think that we're responsible for it. We have to be tempered in our spiritual life and careful as we think about the growth and expansion of the reign and rule of God. We participate in God's work. We actually don't do that work for God. Next, we turn to the latter part of verse 3 and verse 4. This is perhaps the most well-known passage in this text uh, at the ending of verse 3. Swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. This language is really important and it's critical because the metaphor here has to be in context. Typically speaking, uh, this culture is agrarian. And so uh, people farm, they grow stuff, they have farm implements. And when there's a call to war, in other words, the homeland is being threatened, these, these farmers then would take their implements they use in their agrarian lifestyle, in other words, the metal that they used for agrarian life, and then they would transform them and use them as an employment for war. They, they literally turned things they used for farming into weapons. Now, in this text, they're called to do the opposite of that work. They're to take the things used for war and turn them into things used for farming. They're to move away from conflict and violence. Why? Well, this is a a new age God is bringing into being. This is a time for being the people of God. Victory comes through God's redemptive act, not through taking matters into our own hands. That's what we just covered a few moments ago, that this work of judgment is God's work to do. This gathering of people is God's work. It's not our work. It's our work to join God in that effort, but never to take responsibility for it. Victory comes through God's redemptive act, not taking matters into our own hands, as I mentioned. So if people can come to Jerusalem, they will find the response of a people who have been with God. No war, no violence. God is the only one who can bring this kind of world into being. And the text goes on to give us this lovely picture in verse 4. Each of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree. These are symbols of abundance in the ancient world within their culture. Your vines and your vineyard and your fig tree being productive and providing shade was a sign that you were blessed by God. There's no fear because there's no threat. This is the new age that God is bringing into being. And then it goes on to tell us that the mouth of the Lord of the armies is spoken. The language there is really peculiar. It uses kind of this militant language for God, bringing about this age of peace, of, of uh, a lack of war, a lack of violence. It's a key passageway for us here. And, and it's this, that the, the vision of the future leaks into today. Now, while this work of God is in the future and it's God's work to do, we're called to live faithfully in the midst of the knowledge that that's the world God is bringing into being. We do so and live this way knowing that God is doing the heavy lifting. And so we can live with a confidence of God's healing grace. We know that God is 
moving in a way that takes us to this vision in uh, chapter 4, at verses 3 and 4. So our approach to the work, our approach to the way we live as followers of Jesus is urgent, but yet it's peaceful. It's clear, but it's loving. This age is coming, and it's God's responsibility to bring it into being. And so the question that we wrestle with and we have to really ask ourselves is, are we living our lives as if this is a world God is bringing into being? Do our lives more and more reflect what this future age is looking like. And in that sense, we can be a part of God's work of leaking or kind of breaking that future into the very present in which we live. And now finally, we turn to verse five. This text in verse five now turns to our choices in the midst of this revelation. This revelation that God is going to do a redemptive work of bringing healing and gathering people together and that there's going to be this great word of God that goes forth from uh, the, the, the mountain, if you will. There's a comparison and a call here. It says in verse 5, though all the peoples walk each in the name of their God. That's the contrast. So uh, everyone is walking, uh, some to their own God and some to the true God. So that there's people walking in the name of their God, but it says at the end of verse 5, as for us, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. You see, knowing this, the people are called to make a choice. And the choice is, which God will they walk with? Who will they follow? Who will they make their lives modeled after? Sometimes, you know, as I think about our own life and how we are called to live, we sometimes uh, avoid these types of choices. And that's the key passageway for us, that our walk with God requires persistence and grace. A question for us to think about is, do we live each day with the confidence of knowing that God has this? You see, the burden is God's. The inevitability is God's. The certainty belongs to God. So knowing this, we have to make the choice daily to be sanctified in that truth. Are we going to live every day in the truth that we follow a God that is bringing about this age that Micah is describing? We make our worst mistakes when we try to force the hand of God and somehow make it our work to bring this age into being, as I've mentioned several times just in this podcast, perhaps what this text is calling us to do is to practice a little bit more patience and a little bit more confidence in a God that actually just might have everything under control. If you have comments or reflections, I'd love to hear from you. Please visit my website, revcraig.com. Click on news in the upper right-hand corner. And then on the drop-down menu, you'll see podcasts. You can click on this episode and leave a comment. I'd also encourage you to visit our church's website, ffmc.org, to learn more about free Methodism and how you can connect with our community. For now, I bid you all grace. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.